before I had dry mouth or seal like them. Uh, when we were kids coming up, the uh, candy man, he drove a candy truck and he lived, uh, when we, the four years my dad lived in Arkansas and we lived with him, imagine that. Uh, when he pastored church there in Arkansas, um, we lived uh, kind of city-like. And uh, the first time we had to play football in the streets, didn't have a place to play. Long story short, the candy man lived the next street over, and we'd go over. Mama would give us money every now and then, and then by that time we were selling the grit newspaper and mowing grass and making our own money. And she'd let us go over there to candy man, and that's where my first love of Jolly Ranchers, I saw a big box of 160-count Jolly Ranchers, and I bought them. And ever since then, I've had a love affair with Jolly Ranchers. So one, one good thing is having grandbabies, and they walk up to you at church or wherever I am, and they say, Papa, may I have a Jolly Rancher? And I say, of course. And then I peel it for them and give it to them, and they see that smile. Aren't you glad for children and grandbabies? Thank God for that. All right. We're going to pray at this time. Today's going to be a great day. We have some guests coming for uh, the next service, and uh, also we have some who are out of town today uh, because of uh, going to spend it with their father. And uh, if my father was alive and he was out of town, I would love to be with my father again, and he's watching from heaven today. So let us pray right now and ask the Lord to be with us, shall we? Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for this day. We thank you for everyone that's here. Now we take charge of the atmosphere. And if there would be any spirit that would oppose the Holy Spirit, we take dominion over that, Lord. And we ask that you would move and rule and reign supreme in the sanctuary. And you would touch everyone that needs a touch. Any sickness that's here present today, that you would touch their bodies, Lord, and that you would captivate our mind and our spirit and our hearts by the word of God in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. If you look in Genesis chapter 37, this, this um, lesson will come from there today. And it, it talks about Joseph's dream and uh, the, the life of Joseph and, and, um, and his dream he had. And uh, it just gives his history of that. It talks about his father, Israel loved him very much, and he made him a coat of many colors. And I want to talk to you about just keeping the dream alive, keeping the dream alive. Back when I was uh, 12 years old, going on 13, my mom corrected me one day. She said, son, you were closer to 13 and you were 12. I said, well, I was still 12 when I got the Holy Ghost, June the 8th, 1966, at camp, at youth camp. Uh, Brother Orlin Ray Falls was preaching our youth camp, and he was preaching that night on a subject that is hardly preached about today, but he was preaching on hell so hot you could smell the smoke and feel the flames. And I remember sitting there squirming. I still remember the clothes I had on that. I still remember where I was sitting in that old tabernacle. And um, I can re remember just squirming and thinking, is he ever going to give the altar call? And when he did, I, I literally almost ran to the altar. And uh, I wasn't there just, uh, just a few minutes. And uh, a guy from Opelousas was praying with me. And uh, he had big coat bottle glasses on. Back then they wore real, real thick glasses, I guess because that was the way they made them. His eyesight was real bad, but uh, but I, I started getting the Holy Ghost and he was beating me on the back, just screaming and spitting all over the side of my face. I didn't care that he was spitting on the side of my face. All I heard him say was, you're getting the Holy Ghost, you're getting the Holy Ghost. And I still remember that feeling of when the Holy Ghost first came into my life. There is no other feeling like that in the world. Could you give the Lord a hand clap of praise if you can remember the feeling when you got the Holy Ghost. There's no feeling like that feeling in the world. Whenever the Holy Spirit comes in 
and takes over your tongue and you know that you're speaking a language that you don't know. And if that's not supernatural, then I don't know what is. And then it was in, it was in June the 15th, 1970, when I got another experience. I had another experience at youth camp. They were preaching. They were preaching on doing great things for God. And they were preaching on, even though you're a teenager, God is calling you. And he's calling you and putting his spirit in you. And some of you are going to be great for God. I remember sitting there being just touched by God. And as I sit there, the more I sit there, the more I begin to cry and weep. And I went down to the altar, and I got lost in the Spirit. And I, I took a trip somewhere in the Spirit, and they had to pack me to the boys' dorm, the old wooden dorm. It's no longer there. It's been torn down many years ago. Packed me to the dorm, and they put me in my bunk, and I was just talking with tongues. And, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I was seeing visions, and <clears throat> one of the visions that I saw was a ladder that come down from the heavens, and then I saw angels going up and down that ladder, and then finally one lead angel come down that ladder, and he had a Bible in his hand. He came to me where I was laying on my bed. He took that Bible he held it in his hands, and he touched me on the forehead with it, and then he placed it in my hands, and he said, the Lord Jesus Christ has called you into the pulpit preaching ministry, and you'll be a preacher, and you'll carry the gospel. And then all of a sudden, that vision switched from there. And then I looked over, and the next thing I saw was just a sea of Afro-Americans just a number that no man could number in front of me. And the Lord spoke to me, that angel spoke to me, and he said, you will preach to these people. You will reach these people. And so I was 16 years old when that happened. And so I started preaching. Now, back then when you told your elders that you were called to preach, their quick reply was, get your Bible and get a message and get ready to preach Wednesday night. Exactly what my father told me. Still remember it to this day. So I had my Bible that had the picture of Jesus on the front and the picture of kids around him. You know the, the blue-covered Bible that a lot of us got when we were kids. It's the kind of Bible I had, and I studied it. My dad says, you can't preach that. Go get another one. And then you can't preach that. Three times he told me, I can't preach that. And I finally asked him, well, why can't I preach to him? He said, son, evidently the Lord's called you to be a pastor. Those sermons are pastoral messages. And if you preach to him evangelizing, pastor will run you off because you'll say you're meddling. Well, my dad identified my gift, so I began to preach. And all my life, I tried to reach everywhere Don and I pastored. I tried to find Afro-Americans because I wanted my dream to come alive. I wanted my dream to be a part of my ministry. And everywhere we went, everywhere we pastored, started off pastoring in Juris, and we were a little bit successful there. But, you know, I'm like, when is it going to happen? So we had a crusade in Buras. And Brother Perilou, before he was married, he drove a bus down for Brother Cupid. And we had, the first time ever, we had a big crusade in Buras at the high school auditorium. We had speakers on the top of our car. We'd ride around Highway 23 and every subdivision, everywhere we could go. Crusade, crusade. Holy Ghost Crusade, Buras High School Auditorium. And we named the dates of it. And come out, come out. And man, uh, all of a sudden, uh, we, we, we left one night, we forgot and left the speaker horns on top of the car. The next morning, they were gone. I guess our neighbors didn't like the fact that we were advertising the crusade. 
But in that crusade, we packed the auditorium out, and um, there was people getting the Holy Ghost everywhere. Brother Adrian Littlefield was a speaker back then, and, and Don and I were trying to do for God what we were called to do. And we had no Vista cards. We had no follow-up program. We just, I just stood around praying people through the Holy Ghost, and Brother Cupid was there next to me. We were just praying people through right and left, and there was this big... A uh, big, big lady. She was bigger than I was, and uh, uh, she was of the of the uh, of the uh, you know she was very very big and muscular and looked like. And I said, "You getting all the ghost? You getting all the ghost?" And all of a sudden, she looked at me and just wiped her big old tears and picked me up, and spun me around, and kissed me right on the on the cheek. And I said, "I better go find my wife." So, I mean, people's getting the Holy Ghost everywhere, and I'm thinking, man, ain't this grand, ain't this grand, ain't this grand. Dreams coming alive, you know, God said it's going to happen. I saw the vision, youth camp, man, we're going to fill the church up. The crusade's over on Saturday night. It was Friday and Saturday night. Crusade's over. Sunday morning, get ready, standing by the door, waiting to welcome visitors. What do you think happens? Nobody shows up. They all got the Holy Ghost. But you see, Burris was 99% a major religion and uh, was not of our persuasion. And they were over all the people, and they found out they'd been to the crusade and told them they couldn't come to our church. And so that was that. But we didn't give up. We still kept trying. We still kept trying and moved, 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 moved on in life. You see, the dreamer, Joseph, he, he had a dream, and, and he dreamed it, and he told his dream. He told his dream to his brothers, and his brothers were angered by it. And then he told it to his father, and his father said, would I even bow down to you? His father even got angry at him, and then, you know, he told the dream to the wrong people. And there are dream stealers out there. If you don't watch it, they'll steal your dream. That's why as pastor this church, you know, our dream is always out there. And we have to be very careful that we nurture it and we hold it close to our, our spirit and we pray and we seek God about it simply because it's our dream and our vision that keeps us going. And so if you don't have a dream today or a vision about your life, even your life, what you're going to do in your life, you know, the vocation that you have. You may have dreamed that, you know, when I grow up, I want to be, if your dad was a mechanic, I want to be a mechanic. Well, you know, Brother Davis is a mechanic, but Davis Tate's a mechanic because his father was a mechanic and was a very good mechanic. So he fathered in his dad's footsteps. You know, and Brother Perilou come from a line of carpenters, so it's no strange idea that his sons also follow in that footstep. So your dreams, Brother Tenney taught us this proverb, your dreams will come to pass if you don't oversleep. Your dreams will come to pass if you don't oversleep. So, Don and I left Bierce after three and a half years, and we went from five to 70 in three and a half years. And so we thought, you know, revival's good. We can do this. Went to Bill Platt. And 12 months at Bill Platt. That's why, and that's where I found out, you have to be matched to culture. And if you don't match that culture, you are in for a ride of your life. And if you don't fit the culture, the food don't agree with you, nothing agrees with you, so you need to go somewhere where you can fit in. And so we found out my wife was the one that had the hardest time there. You know, I tried to fit in as much as I could. The first day I was there preaching as pastor, I was preaching, and a guy named George stands up in the middle, and he says, I don't agree with that. I said, shut up and sit down. I got the mic. Yeah, oh, my God. That's some of those real moments you talk about, that, like, did that really happen? Yes, it really happened. 
So what? What? So don't don't none of y'all try that today, please. I hope I would have the Holy Ghost right now. You know that's when I was young. So the dreams that I had kept me going. I remember praying, and my mother and my father had taught us to pray. And I, I just want to drop something in here as a nugget. If if you don't have a prayer life outside church, then you're really not going to make it. Because it's your discipline of prayer and reading the Bible that keeps you when your dream can be stolen by dream stealers. If you have a dream and you know it's from God, be careful who you tell your dream to. Because everybody's not excited about your dream. Well, my dream ought to be safe in my brother's hands. Well, look at Joseph. I mean, he told the dream to his brothers, and look what they did him. They put him in a pit. They first wanted to kill him. And then Reuben said, no, let's don't. Let's put him in a pit and sell him to the, to, 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 the, to the gypsies coming along. And that's what they did. They sold him into slavery. There's dream stealers out there that will steal your dream, that will rob you. Where would this church be today? Look back at the elders that built this church. Where would this church be today if they would have told their dreams to the wrong people and their dream been stolen or if they've been easily discouraged? I am telling you, living for God and having the dreams that you have, if you're easily discouraged, you're not going to make it. Because disappointment is going to come. Trials are going to come. Situation is going to happen, but you just got to bow up and say, I'm better than you are. And if you can bow up and stand in the face of your enemy and say, this dream is of God and it's going to come to pass and I'm going to stay here until it does, then you will make it. If not, you'll never make it. And so fast forward the story. 48 years old, 47, I believe, maybe at the time, between 47 and 48. Brother Cole gives Don and I and Jason a charge in front of the church, the whole church. He says, I'm calling y'all to Ethiopia with us to go and preach the healing service, and I want y'all three to go. Well, he forgot to just tell us that the tag to that price was $10,000 to go on that round trip. I'm like, where are we going to get this money, man? And I said, well, you know what? we got to pray for some miracles here. And the church helped us. And, you know, I preached out and made a few extra bucks. And uh, it was it was tough trying to raise that money. And uh, we get go over there, you know, and uh, good gracious alive, it's hot. You know, you think it's hot here. Let's go over to Africa. You think it's you think food's bad here? Just go to Africa. They don't eat over there like we eat here, and you can't eat a lot of stuff. And it's just the conditions are just deplorable at, at best. And you're in a third world country, and so we go. We go. Long story short, we go to the crusade, and we're out there, and just people everywhere. You know, Ethiopians everywhere. And Brother Cole says we made a change. You're not going to be. Able Free preaching and healing service. So I'm sitting in the back. And then so the last day of the crusade comes and all of a sudden Brother Cole says, go get Brother Marcelli. And so they go get me and bring me up. And he said, you're up next. And I said, well, my Bible's back there. Really, really don't need it anyway. He said, you got some? I said, yes, sir, I got some. And so um, he went up there and said, we have another man from the United States coming. And so all of a sudden I walked to the pulpit, which was a big concrete tabletop, six inches thick, four feet wide, and it stretched 20 feet across. And uh, that was a pulpit. And, uh, and so I stood behind that pulpit and I grabbed the mic. And all of a sudden I look out across that great sea of Ethiopia. They estimated over 500,000 Ethiopians were there that day under the tent. And all of a sudden, I am not 47 years old. 
I'm 16 years old, laying in my bunk at youth camp. And I'm seeing my vision of when I was called to preach, and God said, you're a priest to these people. I couldn't say a word to those Ethiopians. I could not get my mouth to work. And Brother Cole's behind me and he said, for the love of God, say something or sit down. Kind of like trying to get myself together because I got tears rolling down my cheeks. I couldn't say nothing for a couple of minutes. And all of a sudden, something welled up in me. And I started preaching with the fire. He said, you got 15 minutes. And something welled up within me with the fire, and I started preaching. And I got done. I turned around and gave the mic. He said, take five more minutes. And Brother Cole just didn't do that. And then I got done with that five minutes. He said, take five more minutes. I took five more minutes, and then I walked off and gave him the mic. And he grabbed me and hugged me, and he said, I've never seen anything like it. Never has there been a man that has come here and connected with these people like you have. He said, what has happened? And I told him later what had happened, and he had tears just rolling down his cheeks. He said, Brother Marcelli, you will forever be connected to these people. And for four years straight, I traveled to that land. The conditions were terrible. They were hot. It ruined the clothes that we had. Our white shirts, we just had to leave them over there because they were full of red dust and dirt, and we, we, they were just, it was just nasty. I can't tell you how deplorable. There's Jason sitting over there. The water that came out of the shower, you had to tape your mouth, hold your mouth closed because the shower that came out looked like ditch water that runs through our ditches when, when we have a rain. And, 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 and Donna says, you have to be called to these people, Rick. Because you keep it 65 degrees in our house all the time. And you come here and we don't even have a fan. And said, so you're burning up, you're sweating. And she said, you're just nasty. And she said, you have to be called to these people. I have nurtured my dream through the years. I have kept my dream alive through the years. And I am called to those people, and I have a connection with those people. But I also have a connection with you people. I remember when I came here to preach my first revival as just a kid. You know, I was 18 years old when I came here to preach my first revival in that old red block building. And... When I preached the first revival, we had seven men get the Holy Ghost the first week. And the second week, we didn't have anybody because that's when I started dating Donna. And they, Brother Thornton said that I got, I left spiritual and went to carnal. Well, you know what? If you're going to be hooked up in life with somebody, it's got to be somebody that shares your dream. It shares your calling. And I'm going to tell you one thing. I got it right when I got married. I got it right. That's one thing I didn't mess up. I got that right. Because that little woman that I'm tied to, we keep each other motivated. We keep each other charged up. We won't, let, we won't let the other one forget about the dream. She'll come and sit down in my man cave with me, and she'll sit over there, and she'll say, let me tell you what the Lord's dealing with me about, and we need to try this, and we need to try that, and let's plan this, and let's plan that. That's all about the dream we have for the kingdom of God. You see, it's bigger than we are. It's never been about Rick and Donna. It's always been about the kingdom of Jesus Christ. It's always been about reaching a firebrand and pulling them out of the burning. It's been all about saving some of your kin people and some of your lost people. It's always been about can we reach another soul before the Lord comes. It's never been about 
how much am I going to get paid? You know, every job I ever got, I never really asked him how much I was going to get paid because my daddy always taught me, don't ask that question. And I found out it always worked better because you might get more, Daddy said. And you know what? It's never about accolades of men. The dream that Jesus put in me when I was 16 years old, it was not about money. It wasn't about buildings. It wasn't about climbing the ladder of being a presbyter at one time in my life and serving on the district board for eight years, and it wasn't about preaching the camp meetings that I preached and, and being this and being that. It wasn't never about all of that. It's always been about souls. And I've always said, if I can't win souls here, I'll go somewhere where I can find out where I can win souls. And you know what? I found this place to be a hotbed of souls. There's people that pass on, 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 on um, when we had to do the traffic study, when we built our building five and a half years ago now. February would be six years that we moved in. But when we did a traffic study, they said 15,000 cars a day passed on Lee Road in front of the firehouse. 15,000 cars a day. How many people is that that live around us? We have a building that will seat 614 people. We can get enough chairs in here, and now we can hang them on the wall, and we can get more. But I'm not going to be sad. It's not about numbers to me, but as long as there's an empty chair in here, this church is too small. And as long as there's empty places in a parking lot, this church is too small. It's not about number. It's not about how many people. It's about how many souls are going to go to heaven. That dream drives you. If you don't have a dream, then you don't have a, a, a driver that drives you to motivate you. What gets you up out of the bed? What, what makes your motor turn? What makes you excited? I want to tell you what makes me excited. It's teaching a Bible study to somebody that's never heard about the power of the name Jesus. That's what gets me excited. What gets me excited? Preaching on a Sunday morning when I got a bunch of new people out there that's never heard the gospel and I get to preach it to them for the first time. That's what gets my motor running. You know what gets my motor running? It's about going somewhere to eat and smiling at my waitress and telling them to have a good day and there's a connection and we can make a connection for later on. That's what makes my motor turn. What makes your motor turn? What's your dream? I hope it's more than being a mechanic. I hope it's more than being a carpenter. I hope it's more than running a business. I hope that if you are born again and you're heaven bound, I hope that your dream is you want to be a soul winner. You want to be a soul winner. You know, Don and I have always had a Bible study chart and taught Bible studies. I never really wanted to be a mechanic. I didn't see nothing fun about busting your knuckles. They told a joke one time that of something about mechanics that they probably wasn't going to make it in the party gates because their language wasn't real good. Well, I don't know even what the joke was, and and uh, but I know in life there's things that happen. Sometimes you get upset, and your dream, you look at yourself and say, I'm just not going to make it. You see, Joseph, when he saw the dream, that's all he saw was a dream. He didn't see the he didn't see the pit that his brother put him in. He didn't see being sold into slavery. He didn't see being in foreign land. He didn't see being in prison. He didn't see being any any of that. None of that was on his radar. 
All he saw was a dream. But I want to ask you, brothers and sisters, when Joseph was in the pit, when he was sold into slavery, when he went to a foreign land, then he went to prison, what kept him going in all of those hard areas? I'm going to tell you what kept him going. I had a dream. And my dream was, and I'm not leaving this world till I see that come to pass. When my surgery went bad in 2003, there's one thing that kept my motor running and kept me going. And when they told me, when the, nobody would tell me what was going on. I, I knew I couldn't move from my uh, uh, abdomen down. I knew, I knew I couldn't feel anything. I just, I knew that. But nobody would tell me anything. So everybody's talking behind my back and whispering. And I'm like, what are they doing that for? Why don't they just talk? And finally, one day I said, you know what? I'm not going to therapy until that little therapist tells me what's happening, what's going on. Why I got to put these straps on my leg to move? How come I can't stand up and walk? And how come I ain't got no feeling? And so the little therapist, I said, close the door. She said, I can't. I said, if you want me to go to therapy today, you're going to come over here by this bed and you're going to tell me what's wrong with me. And she said, Okay, they're saying, what a nice man, but he'll never walk again. I said, was that what they said? She said, yeah. I said, well, let's go to therapy and prove them wrong. So two and a half years, I worked very hard in therapy. Because I had a dream, and my dream didn't show me no wheelchair. My dream didn't show me no walker. Every stage I was ever on, I was walking and preaching. And I'm going to tell you right now, this is not the end of my dream. My handicap is not the end of my dream. Because my dream don't end there. My dream still has me on stage walking and preaching to people I ain't never seen before. I don't know where they at, but when I get there, I'll know it. The presence of of the angels that's walked in here right now is stirring someone to remember your dream. And I ask every one of you today that's Holy Spirit filled that you will remember your dream of not being a preacher, of not being a mechanic, but being a soul winner for Jesus Christ. Because if our kin people are saved, it's going to be because we tell them. If our co-workers are saved, it's because we're going to reach them. If our family is saved and our other people are saved that we know, it's going to be because we throw them a lifeline. I am telling you today, God has his hand on every one of you today. And it's time we get to work. My heart is burdened and heavy today. When I preach this kind of stuff, I just want to go out and find people. I, 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 left, I left because of the times one time years ago, and I drove till I got to the trailer park. Somewhere, I think it's either before or after. It's after Covenant High School, the trailer park that the, the record people own. And... I, they had me so stirred up about reaching people that I left because of times, got in that Z71, drove faster than I should have because I was going to get home before dark. I was going to go to that trailer park. And I was going to knock every door in that trailer park before I went home. And I knocked every door in that trailer park. Jake's, that's what, was that, that's what it's called. It. Every trailer in there I knocked on them and gave them a track. And I got to one person in the back, and he said, I know you. He said, my name is so-and-so. He said, I lived in that parsonage right across from y'all. Our neighbors there, 
Newt Zion, his grandfather pastored that church. Well, I pastored our church. And he said, we used to get out of church early and y'all still be singing. And said, one time y'all was running around outside. <laughs> Imagine that. Brother Poe was there, I think, then, when we was running around outside. Remember that? All that stuff we did back then. Now, God, if you thought we was crazy now, if you would have came around then, we sure enough was. Had some stuff happen, though. I'm thinking about bringing him back, get some things shook up. Elvis ain't the only one to get all things shook up around here. Brother Poe can. He'll make you pay your tithes right. He'll make you get right, won't he? He'll sneak up behind you and put that hand on you. I know there's one sister tried to avoid him. Let me tell you a story. One sister tried to avoid him. She didn't want him coming nowhere around him. She didn't want him coming nowhere around her, man. And she avoided him. I mean, she avoided him. And all of a sudden, he said, watch this. I'm going to do the sneak attack. He went out the side. Nobody knew where he's coming in, brother. He came in that back, and all of a sudden, I seen that hand of his reach over and get a hold of the top of that head. <laughs> I saw her fall down on that pew. I don't know if it was Jesus or her fainting, but her worst fear had happened to her. Brother Poe had put the claw on her. We called it the Poe claw. And so that young man got the Holy Ghost from the trailer park. And I baptized him in Jesus' name. I wish there was a happy ending to the story, but it's not. It's too sad to say. And if I would tell the ending of his story, it would bother some of you that are going through the same thing even now. So I'll just spare the details, but I will tell you, the Lord did honor me knocking on every door there by at least one person. And I don't know what his end is. I just know that I gave him a chance. I had doors slammed in my face. It didn't matter. Brothers and sisters, it didn't matter. There's people rude to me. They call me them other people that wear white shirts. That's what they call me. But I didn't have a white shirt on. I had a blue shirt on. But I guess to them, I reminded them of them kind of people. But I told them who I was, and I invited them to church, and I told them we did home Bible studies. I didn't have a card. I didn't have anything to give them with our church information on it. All I had to give them was my burden. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, that's all you need is give them your burden. Your dream is driven by your burden. Your dream is driven by the power that's in you through your burden. Your burden is your motivator. If you don't have a burden to reach the lost, then you're not going to worship God when you get here. If you don't have a burden to live for Jesus Christ, then you're going to live halfway. Your burden is what keeps you living right. Your burden is what drives you to be here when it's church time. Your burden is what drives you to live right and talk right and act right and stay committed. It's your burden that keeps you keeping the dream alive. You know, and I'm going to close and I could just talk for another few minutes, but I'm not. I've kept the dream alive in my life since I was 16 years old. And all I ever wanted to do was preach, share the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's all I ever wanted to do. My dream was always... I found a uh, I found a note that I wrote my father, and I said, "Dad, 
when I grow up, I want to be a preacher like you. Well, I hope so. Because he was a faithful. I'm saying to you today, your dream that you have, I want to ask you, have you put any prayer to that dream lately? Well, are you as fired up as you used to be? Are you living as red hot for Jesus Christ as you once was? How is it? How's it going? Where are you at in your walk with God? Are you as passionate as you used to be? Where's your passion? How's your passion fueled? By my dream. Sitting around the table at camp talking to young preachers. They look at me and they say, are you always like this? They asked me the other day, are you always like this? I'm like, like what? You always like talking all the time about this stuff? I'm like, yeah, what else is there to talk about? Talk about chocolate, we're talking about hunting. And I can eat chocolate while I'm talking about preaching. That's no problem. I'm telling you today that I'm more fired up than I've ever been. And I want all of you to make a pledge and a commitment with me right now. I want you to say, right now, say, say it with me. Right now, as of now, I'm going to recommit my life to Jesus Christ. And I am going to become a soul winner. Lord, in Jesus' name. Oh, Lord, feel your spirit in here right now, real heavy. I'm asking you, Lord, you heard them all say it. There were a few that didn't say it loud, but Lord, I know that the people sitting in front of me are precious people, and they love you. And Lord God, I'm praying you'll baptize them with a baptism of holy boldness. They will speak out and tell people about their conversion and about their new birth experience. And, Lord, that we may pull firebrands from the burning. And I ask you, Lord, let us all be so winners that the kingdom of God may grow. In Jesus' name, no one said amen. God bless you. Go have some coffee and some whatever they got out there. Let's have a good day.